Everyone, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Vignesh, and I'll be talking about UI testing in iOS. So without further ado, let's, let's dive in. So uh, the points that I'll be covering today, I'll just give you a brief background around uh, UI testing, how to set them up and write them, and some tips and tricks around how to make them more reliable. So what are UI tests? Well, these are high-level integration tests that test the uh, interactions between UI components, and these tests assert on the results of those interactions. So why, why write UI tests, given that they can be flaky? Well, they're a good way to test both existing and new features from a high level, and they're also a good way to cut down on manual QA by automating away some of your happy paths and some of your edge cases as well. So in testing philosophy, there's something known as a testing pyramid. So ideally, ideally you're going to be covering as much as you can with your unit tests, and your UI tests sit near the top of this pyramid. So what that means is that you're not going to have as many UI tests ideally, but you use them to co cover the flows, interactions of an app. Well, let's get to setting up some UI tests. Now, the app that I'm uh, going to be writing a UI test for is none other than our Cocoa Heads app. Now, it still uh, it exists, yes. It still builds and it still works. So it's a pretty basic app. Uh, it just has a table view of uh, upcoming events, and when you tap on an event, it goes to <laughs> it goes to a detail page of that event. So for those of you who haven't set up a UI test in an existing project, I've gone ahead and recorded a little video on how to do that. So I'm going to add a testing target to Melbourne Cocoa Heads. Yep. So I'm going to. Add a new UI testing target. Everything looks okay in here as well. And there you go. It was pretty straightforward to add a UI testing file that contains some stubs in there for you. Uh, you know, it is also possible to create new projects with uh, UI testing uh, bundled in. So let's go ahead and write our UI test up now. So well, before you write UI tests, ideally you want to set out what steps you want to take in your UI test before you write them. So in our case, we're going to find the first event row, then we're going to tap on that event once we find it, and then we want to assert whether the web view in that detail page exists. Now, in our case, we're not going to be so focused on whether that web view loads up the content successfully. I just want to verify the layout when I tap the, when I go to the detail page. So the first thing we're going to do is find this event row. Now, uh, we're just going to query for that event row in the accessibility hierarchy. And uh, if we can't find that event row within 10 seconds, we're going to fail the test. Uh, so that, that is something you do in UI test a fair bit as well. Uh, you want to guard against uh, edge cases as much as possible. And so once we find that first event row, it's a pretty straightforward step next. We just tap on that event row. And then after that, we're going to assume that we've gone to the detail page and that we're going to try and find that web view that we are talking about earlier. And once we've done that, we assert that the web view exists. So now that we've got everything set up, let's see how it runs in our in Melbourne Cocoa Heads app. Yeah, so that's great. Our test successfully passed, which is what you want when you write a UI test. <laughs> so, now having written UI tests across a few projects now, the, the thing I found myself uh, spending the most amount of time on was just getting these tests to pass and fail for the right reasons, to be more deterministic. So, uh, here's a few tips and tricks in making sure that you, you can get to that end outcome as well of UI tests passing and failing for the right reasons and not being too flaky. So the first one, the UI test recorder. Now, you, you want to use, it's a great place to start if you haven't done much UI testing and if you're spinning up a new UI test suite. Um, it's, it's, it's a great way to also get a feel for the acceptable hierarchy of your app. 
So what, what I find myself doing is that you, I, when I, whenever I use a recorder, I start things up and then I factor out the code that's generated whenever I, when I, as I boot up the test suite. Now, just a forewarning that the auto-generated code does not always compile. So, <laughs> and I strongly advise changing any code that interacts with the network in any way because any code that does that will be flaky in your UI tests. Now, the next thing, it's gonna be a bit controversial, uh, avoiding the use of cross-platform testing frameworks. So, in case you don't, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, there are many cross-platform solutions out there that try to, that, to try to have one uh, set of tests against both iOS and Android apps. The issue I have with those kind of frameworks is that they add another level of abstraction above XE UI test. And I felt that that would make debugging these UI tests much harder than what they have to be. And they already can be pretty hard to debug as it is. Uh, just a note that this is just my two cents. I do know of companies that do use these frameworks successfully. So yeah, it's, your mileage just may vary on that. Now, accessibility identifiers. Now, in a lot of Apple's WWDC videos around UI testing, you'll see a lot of code that looks like this. Now, the reason I don't like this code up here is because it's not very deterministic. You can't really tell whether the element that you're uh, hitting against this query actually exists or not. It's not, it just finds the first element that it finds in the hierarchy. And in this particular case up here too, uh, in our case, referring back to the earlier example of Cocoa Heads, if this event does not exist anymore for whatever reason, uh, this test will fail even though there's still elements that, uh, that are still valid in that table. So what you can do to manage that problem is to set up accessibility identifiers on all the UI components that you need, and then you can make this code look more like this. Now, this is much better because this, uh, this query up here is hitting the, is only going to query against elements with this particular identifier. And that, that's, it's much more programmatic, it's more deterministic, and it's a clearer way to make sure that that you're hitting what you want to find in your UI tests. So, uh, one thing that can that's going to be crop, that can picture cropping up as well is these accessibility identifiers, accessibility labels, and accessibility hits. What's what's the difference between these three? That's a lot of accessibility stuff mentioned just there. So, labels they are what uh, is read out when uh, when a user taps on a user, uh, UI component and it's read out by voiceover. That's what a label does. A hint is an additional description that you can add to that, uh, add to that uh, label if you want more information when the user taps that component. From, from identifiers, from what I've read, they are geared towards UI automation. So using them shouldn't get in the way of the accessibility functionalities of an app. And yes, I recommend using them everywhere. So, uh, it's inevitable when you're running UI tests that there's gonna be some sort of networking or animation delays. Now, the issue with any test that hits these areas of these apps is that when, sometimes when they fail, if you run them again, they'll pass. So that's, that's a classic case of a UI test being quite flaky. So, what you can do when when you run into an element that depends on a network, you can use these wait for existence statements. So what these do is that once you've queried for an element, you can simply wait uh, while this element's being found in the, in the hierarchy, and it'll wait for up to a certain amount of time in seconds that you define. The, the, the awesome thing about these statements is that once, once this statement finds that an element exists, it will keep on going with the UI test. It won't just sit there waiting around for this element to be found. So it's, it's much better than using sleep statements. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend using these anywhere where you have any sort of network or animation delays. And you, know, you can think of them as smarter sleep statements. They're just, they're just there to manage that aspect there for you. And while we're on networks, I recommend looking into some sort of backend. Now, I found when I was writing UI tests, the biggest cause of UI test failures of any kind was that the network was either too slow or returned an error. Uh, 
and that would cause your test to fail. So I do recommend looking into options to manage that network uh, backend or network calls for you. Now, there are many ways to do this. There's, there's, a, there's it ranges from anything like mocking your entire network layer in the app. Uh, you can also set up mock environments in CI. So you can have a box up, up in the cloud that's dedicated just for UI tests. Uh, whatever approach you end up going with in the end, like the end goal is to make sure that any network call uh, in UI tests are always hitting the same environment. Like you don't want this environment to change too much when you're running UI tests. It just keeps the whole thing like more like a sealed box. Like that, it's, it's deterministic and it keeps the UI tests happy. So. Just to sum things up, there are benefits to writing UI tests, and there are pathways, uh, to, believe it or not, to writing non-flaky UI tests as far as possible. And just a little tidbit about myself, uh, I am looking for my next role. So if you or anyone that you know of is looking for an iOS developer or an automation engineer, well, feel free to have a chat. And that wraps up my talk for tonight. Hey, um